Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the LGS Foundation's Meeting of the Minds Family Day. I know we're all very excited for this day to be here. I'm Natalie Gilmore, President of the Board of Foundations um, for the LGS Foundation uh, Board of Directors. And I'm also mom to Lily Gilmore, who is um, 20 year old and our daughter. She uh, started with infantile spasms when she was six months old, like many of you. Um, we too have tried over 25 different medications, lots of different treatments, um, diets, vagal nerve stimulator, lots of other things, um, you know, and it definitely has been a long journey, um, like many of you. Uh, but I think, you know, one thing that we have definitely learned over this time is really not to take anything for granted. You know, all those little great moments that we have with her today are awesome. Um, and they definitely are invaluable and huge for us as a family. Um, I know I'm also so grateful for this foundation and for our community of support that we all give to each other. Um, you know, so I just, it's, it's really invaluable. And let's continue to uh, move forward and support each other every day. Um, there is hope for the future and for our loved ones uh, who live with LGS because we're having this meeting and meetings like this will continue. Um, we've had a great and really insightful two days on Monday and Tuesday earlier in the week where we heard from researchers and various clinicians. In a few minutes, I'm going to turn it over to Tracy, and she is going to go through what we learned from those two days. And then we want to really today focus on hearing from all of you. Um, you all are the patient family experts, and we want to today talk to you and get your experiences. Um, we as family members live through this every day with our loved ones and um, meetings like this. This is our first ever meeting of the minds, and it really is truly crucial um, so that we can focus on bringing the scientists and our family community together so that we can help guide the foundation's research funding strategy. Um, as we seek to find disease modifying therapies for LGS. Um, this event wouldn't be possible without the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. The foundation is one of the recipients of their Rare as One grants. And for this last year and a half, we've been working with them to build our organizational capacity. Um, we're also extremely thankful for our other seven other sponsors who have sponsored this event today. And we would not be here today without all of you. So thank you for attending and participating and for sharing all that you know and your experiences, which we'll get to in a few minutes. Um, all right. I think, you know what, it's about time for us to get started. And I would love to uh, turn it over now to our executive director, Tracy Dixon Salazar. Tracy, you ready? I'm ready. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm so glad you guys are here for Family Day. We had, uh, as Natalie said, a very exciting two days with the scientists, and many of you were there as well on Monday and Tuesday. Um, we had more than 200 people from around the world register for these three days of meetings, and um, we're just so excited to be growing our community to be bringing together scientists and our partners um, from other advocacy organizations, from industry, bringing together them with you guys, our families um, who are the experts on LGS to really try to move the needle forward on research. Um, so I wanna thank you guys for being here. Um, the, the outline that we're the setup for today, you should have gotten your program. Um, it's also available online is, um, I'm gonna give a talk this morning. I'm gonna try to do my best to recap what we learned from the scientists on day one and two. And then we're gonna have a period where um, about 50 uh, family members who registered um, in an effort to keep the group small, they registered to go into breakout rooms and have a small discussion. And those of you that are viewing at, from home on the live stream, at that time, there will be a, a several hour break and then we'll come back for another talk um, and, and a wrap up where I'll talk about where, where we go next after the meeting of the minds. So um, that's the format for today. And um, I just wanna thank you guys all again for being here. Um, I'm so excited that we're gonna st we're starting these conversations and we plan to continue them. So let's jump right in and see, start trying to recap what we learned in the first two days. 
So as Natalie said, the whole purpose of the meeting of the minds is really to bring all the stakeholders together. Um, we've got patient families who are experts in LGS. We have scientists who are experts on research. We have clinicians who are experts on uh, treating patients and families. Um, we've got our advocacy partners because LGS overlaps so many of the other disorders out there. And we're so much stronger when we work together. We've got our industry partners who are developing therapies for our loved ones. Um, so it's really about bringing everybody together. And specifically, we have a lot of conversations we need to have together, but we wanted to focus on the, this one first, and that is how do we get to a disease-modifying therapy? Right now, we have treatments for LGS that treat the symptoms, and really just one symptom, the symptom of seizures. Um, our kids are often on, you know, other medicines for behaviors, for, you know, constipation, for, uh, um, uh, spasticity for other issues, but but those aren't considered part of the LGS treatment. It's really just seizures. And we want to shift that to start thinking about treating the whole syndrome, the whole disease. And that and we want to do that first. And I'll be talking about that more in a little bit, but we wanted to do that first because even if you have uh, your child uh, starts having seizures and you get to the best doctor, one of the best doctors in the world, and you have unlimited resources, you're extremely wealthy and you can do anything you want, you're not limited by insurance, that science and medicine really can't help our children, not in any sort of systematic way. And so we wanted to get the scientists talking about how to change that and how to, how to really move the needle so that if you do get to really good care, that it can actually make an impact. And we know how to do that in, in ways other than just being luck. Luck shouldn't be our strategy for finding the right treatments and cures for our loved ones. And the, so this will really guide the LGS Foundation's research strategy moving forward. There we go. So the meeting was really planned and organized by our five moderators. And um, we also uh, worked closely with them at the LGS Foundation. Um, and these are all, almost all of these are members of our professional advisory boards. We had Dr. Heather Mefford from St. Jude's, Ann Paduri from Boston Children's, Eric Marsh from, oops, hang on, Eric Marsh from CHOP, with Brenda Porter from Stanford and Scott Baraban from UCSF. And it was really great. They brought together, I thought, which was a great meeting. So what I'm gonna try to do is just summarize each of the talks for you. And all of these recordings are available online. So you can start, you can go onto this site that you're on right now if you're watching from home. If you're not watching from home, we can get the link for you to, to log into the site and you can watch the videos from each of these talks. So I kicked us off with the first talk. And um, so these are the, the speakers for session one, which kicked off the first day. And the, the title of the session was, what do we know about LGS and what are our ongoing questions? So I kicked off with the first talk and really set the stage by talking about our LGS journey. And I wanted to um, uh, share that with you again here in case there's anybody that's watching from home that um, hasn't met us and doesn't know our story. Um, but basically, my daughter, Savannah, um, who is now 28 years old, uh, was born a typical, healthy, developing child. She developed typically till she was two years old when she had her first seizure. And initially, they didn't call them seizures. They called them spells or episodes or events. Um, and we later found out that they did that because they didn't want to label her with epilepsy and seizures. It was something that would follow her around. So our first introduction to epilepsy was the stigma of epilepsy. The seizures uh, really uh, started when she was age three, age three at two. She had four seizures and then she went six months without having any. And then at age three, the seizures came back. They came back with a vengeance. And at that point, they, they diagnosed her with epilepsy. And back then, they had three types of epilepsy, idiopathic, cryptogenic, and symptomatic. And um, I'm glad that we don't use those terms much anymore because they're really difficult to uh, understand. I'm not, still not sure I understand them. But essentially, idiopathic uh, means presumed genetic. Cryptogenic means we don't know what caused it. And symptomatic means that there's a structural cause that you can see on the MRI. Um, so at age three, Savannah started having hundreds of seizures a day due to too many to count. And she would really spend the next 16 years having uh, seizures every day, uh, complete unpredictability overall. Oh, boy. Is my screen messed up to you, Jeff? Hmm. 
No. Okay. I'm going to keep going. It does. Okay. I'm going to just pop out of this. Okay. Tech issues day for me, apparently. Share screen. Let's move this over. All right, let's try that again. Sorry, guys. Can you see the screen now? All right. Um, so Savannah quickly started having more than one type of seizure and then uh, wasn't diagnosed with LGS till the age of five. And when she was diagnosed at the age of five, we thought that they had missed the diagnosis up until that point. And um, really what I now know and what we now know from the research is that she wasn't born with LGS. Nobody's born with LGS. It's something that develops over time um, in these children as they're continuing to have seizures in most cases. And really she began to cognitively decline at that point. All we really knew about LGS back then was that it was, there was a ton of different causes of it. And it was this grouping of symptoms, multiple seizure types, moderate to severe cognitive impairment and slow spike in wave on the EEG. And even that definition has changed over time. So Savannah continued to have seizures, as I said, for 16 years, and she entered what we call the treatment loop in LGS. And, and many of you are very familiar with that, where you know, she was given the diagnosis and then she um, was worked up for surgical evaluation. She was not a candidate for surgery that would remove the region of the brain that was seizing called resective surgery. Um, and she was a candidate for palliative brain surgery, but we tried tons and tons of medicines and we just uh, tried and failed over, over uh, 26 different medications across that 16 year period. She had more than 40,000 seizures and it's very similar today. I still meet families that are going through this, this same experience. Um, we uh, did get worked up for surgery. She is a candidate for corpus callosotomy and for VNS. She does have the VNS. But I think that, that these palliative, this concept of palliative brain surgery really speaks to how severe LGS is because we know if we get surgery for our loved one, that's not going to stop the seizures. It might reduce them and we hope it reduces them, but it, um, it, we, we were told it's not going to stop them. And yet we go forward with this treatment anyway, because we're just, we're so desperate. There's also diets and other devices and um, alternative therapies. And we tried many of those. When Savannah was 18, we actually did find uh, the cause of her seizures. Up until that point, nobody had been able to identify a cause in her. She was labeled as having cryptogenic uh, LGS back then, so unknown cause. And when she was 18, the genomic revolution happened, and we found that she had genetic mutations in calcium channel genes. And we put her on a medicine that, that acts on calcium channel genes, and it really improved her life and her quality of life. So she's 28 now, and we're coming up on year 11 of her being on this medicine, which really made a huge difference for her. Um, she had a 95% reduction in seizures, a nearly 100% reduction in the amount of time she'd go into status epilepticus. Uh, the 300 seizures a month that she was having on average dropped down to about uh, 15 to 20 a month. And she's just doing much better. She started learning and developing again. But this is really rare. This type of stability doesn't often happen. And I meet, um, uh, I meet families every day of uh, children who are young and adults who are living with LGS that have never found any period of remission where LGS can go into these recurrence and then it can remit and it can recur. But this long type of remission or, or stabilization is, is really rare. And I think it was really important to set the stage for the doctors and, and make it clear to them that there's no systematic way to help those that are living with LGS. And so we needed the researchers, we needed the scientists to, to help us to find a way to treat LGS in a more holistic way, to do better. We've been treating LGS the same way for 20 years. We, we, we throw a drug at it or, or some other treatment, we hope for the best. And we've been doing that for the entire you know, 20 plus years. My daughter's been alive and in the literature, we've been doing it the same way. And we want to be more systematic about that. And I'm going to talk about that in a minute. It's not just my daughter, Savannah, who um, has these issues. We did hold a patient-focused drug development meeting um, back in 2018. And we came to you in the community. We asked you, 
what mattered most to you? And one of the main things that came out of that PFDD meeting, which stands for Patient Focused Drug Development Meeting, um, there's more information about that online, but it's really about hearing from the patients. What mattered to you? We had a number of our families give testimony. We did a survey in the community. And really a, a big thing that came out of it was this concept of a hierarchy of needs in LGS. So you might remember Maslow's hierarchy of needs from psychology class in school, where in order to reach the, the top level of the pyramid, the blue up here, um, to living your best life, you need to have certain needs met, like your physiological needs and safety and love and belonging. For LGS, we're really dealing with such a, a more extreme, more severe end. We're dealing with death regularly in our community. We're dealing with crisis constantly, seizures, status epilepticus, injury, infection, aspiration pneumonia, um, being in the ICU. And then if we're not, if our kids aren't in crisis, we're doing whatever we can to try to keep them out of crisis, right? Are they eating? Are they sleeping? Are they taking their meds? Are they going to the bathroom? Are they safe? Um, and then, you know, if we can reach a point where our loved one with LGS is actually doing any of that for themselves, I mean, my daughter is, is much higher functioning with LGS, but she, most of that stuff, eating, sleeping, going to the bathroom, she doesn't do on her own. And so we don't really know what's at the top of this pyramid for living our best life, best life. and it, it creates this very severe constant crisis mode that we're living in, where we just have this chronic traumatic stress over and over and over, and we never reach stability. So we really felt strongly that a disease modifying therapy would be uh, something that we wanted to ask scientists for. And I just want to talk about that. So a disease modifying therapy delays, slows, reverses, or prevents the underlying biology of the disease. It treats the disease process. And in addition to disease, treating the disease process, it also has to improve how patients feel, function, and survive. Um, so it's a pretty high bar that's set for disease-modifying therapy. And we don't have any of those for LGS. We don't have anything that treats the disease itself. And the disease itself is, is, is the abnormal EEG patterns, which we're going to talk about. What we have now are things that treat the symptoms, um, the symptom of seizure, the symptom of behavior, if we go see a behavioral specialist. Um, and, and that's two separate drugs, right? It's a symptom of GI issues is yet another medicine, right? It's three separate drugs. So sleep medicines, that's a fourth one. There's no one treatment that addresses um, the many, many issues in LGS. And it's we, we know that um, if the scientists have been studying this for a long time, but we know from the Institute of Medicine that it can take 10 to 17 years for the findings from a scientific lab to be integrated into the patient experience. Um, you know, my daughter, her, we sequenced her, her genes, you know, 10 years ago, 11 years ago, and there's still families today who can't get that. You know, and the, we sequenced it because she was, I was a scientist. I was working in a lab, so I had access to that. That's what I did every day. But 11 years later, I still meet families who can't get whole exome and whole genome sequencing for their loved one with LGS. And so we, we don't have time to wait. So families want to help. And this was really the message that I sent in session one to the families. For session two, or for session one, the second speaker was Elaine Worrell. And, and I really strongly encourage all of you guys to, to listen to this talk. Elaine gave a beautiful talk about what we know about LGS today. And this is in order to get a diagnosis of LGS, um, you know, and meet all the criteria, you would have these features. You would have multiple types of seizures with tonic seizures being present in nearly everybody. Uh, the age of onset of the seizures would be under the age of eight. It most often starts the seizures in infancy. Um, and then the next most common age is under the age of 10. But um, LGS itself is usually diagnosed between the ages of three and five years old, but it can be diagnosed at any time. We have families today that are getting the diagnosis uh, for many reasons. You need to have the abnormal EEG seen on um, in LGS, and those are shown over here on the right of this slide. Slow spike and wave, and then something called GPFA, or generalized proxismal fast activity. These are both signs that something has gone horribly wrong in brain development, and they're signs of brain damage. And um, these are the key features of LGS in addition to the seizure types. And then the fourth thing is intellectual disability. This is not always present at the time of diagnosis. When my daughter was diagnosed with LGS, she was still not considered developmentally delayed or intellectually disabled. Um, and that's true in about one third of all LGS kids, but it's present in nearly everybody within five years of seizure onset. So it's, it's associated with LGS very heavily. 
We also learned from Dr. Worrell that LGS evolves over time. So this was a study where um, uh, they, this group of researchers, Amberg and Dr. Levy and Testa, followed a group of patients who came into the epilepsy clinic when their, uh, their initial diagnosis, which is down here at the bottom, and then at the end of follow-up uh, several years later. And you can see when they came in, they had one diagnosis. You can see like four, people, four of these kids had another diagnosis, six were undiagnosed, four had LGS, 23 had West syndrome, um, 10 had generalized epilepsy, and 11 had focal epilepsy. But when they followed them across this multiple year period, you can see how many of the ones on the bottom converged onto the pink LGS box up at the top. 22 ultimately had LGS at the end of their follow-up of this two-year period. And um, so LGS is something that happens while, while we're watching. It happens over time. And this concept of an epileptic encephalopathy was introduced. So an epileptic encephalopathy is where you have the seizures, but you also have this very, very abnormal brain waves, right? The slow spike in wave and the GPFA. And that those two things combined lead to more developmental slowing and regression than you would expect um, from just uh, the seizures alone, right? Or from the, the abnormal EEG alone. So this epileptic encephalopathy really quiet requires that you have seizures and then you have this epileptiform activity or these abnormal brain waves. And that has an impact on development. Um, so as long as the slow spike in wave and the GPFA are present, it makes it very, very hard for our kids to learn and remember and develop. And so this was really what Elaine talked about is what we know about LGS today. Then Anup Patel came in and he talked about uh, what, what we know about the causes of LGS. Um, and uh, we uh, there, I think many of you know that there's been this explosion in the number of genes that are associated with early life seizures. And many of those genes are, have also been um, seen in, in kids who have evolved into having LGS. So there's no one gene out there. Um, these are all genes that cause seizures in, in the very young children, and it can cause them in adults too. Um, and there's no one gene that means that, that these kids will develop LGS. Like if you have a mutation in one of these genes like DNM1, um, every kid who has a DNM1 gene mutation isn't gonna get LGS, but a subset of them do. And we don't understand why, but the cause of their seizures that then evolved into LGS is one of these genes. And so I really strongly suggest if you, if your loved one with LGS hasn't um, had a gene panel or exome sequencing or genome sequencing and hasn't had it done in, the, in or, or at least um, reanalyzed in the last two years to go look, because this is an area of research that's really exploding. Um, another area is this concept of um, brain imaging has advanced amazingly over the last 10 years. And we're starting to uh, identify the causes by having better imaging um, that, that's happened. So, you know, when my daughter was diagnosed, they, they had very simple brain imaging. And, um, you know, it, it's kind of like the cameras on your iPhone, they just keep, or on your Android, right? They just keep getting better and better. That's the same for brain imaging, too. The cameras get better and better. So um, they can go in and they can find if you have, um, a malformation in there, like malformation of cortical development, or if there's a brain injury, or if there's a cyst, or if you um, have had some damage from an infection, um, or things like that. So, so now we, we, you know, we used to know when my daughter was first diagnosed, this is really what we knew about uh, the breakdown of what causes seizures that lead to LGS. 70% were structural, meaning there was something on the MRI that was weird, and 30% were unknown. And today we're able to break that down um, into much more um, detailed information. So about 17% have a structural malformation. So a congenital something that they're born with abnormality. Um, another 33% have a structural malformation. That's an injury. Hypoxic ischemia or HIE is the biggest injury. 15% um, have a genetic defect and there's more than 150 genes. There's infectious, there's metabolic, there's immune, autoimmune. So he talked about um, the causes, and it's really important to know your cause because there are treatments that are emerging in each of these areas that may still work in older children, um, especially in the genetic epilepsies. But there are treatments that are emerging also in the, in the structural um, uh, abnormalities that might benefit you. So it's important to know you have LGS, but it's also important to know you have LGS secondary to what? My daughter has LGS secondary to calcium channel mutations. Other people have LGS secondary to brain injury and, and so on. 
Then Ann Berg came in and she talked about um, uh, specifically, what is it that we're looking at in LGS? What is LGS and how do we study it? If we want a disease modifying therapy, if we want to change treatments, we have to look at seizures, but we also have to look beyond seizures. And so she presents a data on how common it is for, for those with LGS to have issues of mobility, with feeding, with things um, like hand grasping, communication, spoken language, toileting, and how we really need to, if we're going to move the field forward, think about those areas as well, and not just the seizures, which is what we do right now. But she said, you can't ignore the seizures. Because if you think about it, um, they're all, it's all working together. Is mobility, communication, hand use, eating, um, GI issues, behaviors, autonomic dysfunction, sleep, and other things, are they really going to get better if our kids are having seizure after seizure after seizure, right? And then we also have to think about the medications and the daily use of, of rescue, right? And, the, and, and how those are playing a role on sleep, and on a mobility, right? If my my kid has um, is on too many drugs, like most of our kids are going to be even more sleepy. So we can't just look at at each of those things discrete. We have to look at the whole picture, and then we also have to take into account that seizures are playing a role, medicines are playing a role, not getting any sleep, right, or is not is playing a role in that, and then the disease itself um, is playing a role. So it was a wonderful talk. And then Jim Wheelis came in, Dr. Wheelis came in, and he talked specifically about the treatments for LGS. And many of us on this call are familiar with this. Um, there's your first anti-seizure medication. There's your first anti-seizure medication where you treat with just one medicine and then you try to remove that and do another medicine. And then you might start combining medicines and then you might start considering other treatments like surgery uh, devices and dietary therapy. Um, he talked uh, about other medicines that are in clinical trials, which is fantastic. We've got more options uh, coming our way and, and we're not sure if any of these are gonna be disease modifying therapies and we need options, but we also wanna move the science in that direction. So that was, that was session one, um, and I, it was a lot. It was a nice recap of, of this is LGS. This is what we know. This is where we're at. Um, and the, the whole session was meant to be very provocative and uh, try to get people thinking about where are the biggest gaps? Where are the biggest holes? Um, and the biggest gaps and holes really are we need to you know, identify more causes. We don't know the cause in everybody. We need better treatments. Um, we need to look at LGS more holistically. It's not just seizures. Um, and we need the patient voice to be present. And so it was a really great, great session. I just wanted to say, if you have any questions, feel free to type them into the chat. Um, we do have uh, volunteers here today and, and team members who are trying to get your questions to me. So don't hesitate to ask if you have any questions. I'm gonna talk just a little bit about what happened in session two. So, so while session one focused on, um, you know, more like this is LGS, this is what we know now, session two went crazy science. This, so it um, all of a sudden big words started showing up and the scientists um, really had an in-depth discussion about um, how we might fill some of the gaps. Like what are the technologies out there and what, what's out there that might help us fill some of the gaps that were outlined that I just mentioned from session one. Um, and this, this session here focused on clinical research, so stuff that's going on in the clinic, in the hospital. And we wanted to focus on the LGS as a network disorder. I'm gonna talk about that a little bit more. So Dr. Jury and Peters um, from Boston Children's gave a talk specifically, he works a lot with tuberous sclerosis um, patients and uh, many, many tuberous sclerosis patients, uh, they're born with mutations in the TSC genes, evolve into infantile spasms and then evolve to having LGS. And so he's been working on this for a long time. And he really talked about this concept of lesion network mapping. So um, if you do have a structural defect, right? So something you see on the MRI, can we figure out exactly where that's coming from? And they do this in surgery a lot, um, you know, where they go in and then, where is it coming from? What, where in the brain is it coming from? And what does that region do? And in some cases they can take that region out, right? So that's resective surgery, right? When in TS, they can remove the tubers or they can remove the lesion. But in a lot of cases they can't. So what if they could target it, if they could figure out where it is, what structure, then maybe they can target it in other ways. Um, and so he was really talking about how we can map tools that are out there to find the region of the brain that's malfunctioning, where the seizures are starting. 
And then Jennifer Galinas came in and she started talking about, okay, well, we found the region of the brain. Um, what do we, what can we do? And she said, well, when you find the region, you actually start to find these things called IEDs, interictal epileptiform discharges, big word. Um, but this is basically means that you have this abnormal brain activity happening between seizures. And we know this is happening in our kids. Our kids have slow spike and wave between seizures. And so she showed that these persistent brain uh, changes, these IEDs and these abnormal brain waves between seizures can actually start to cause uh, other lesions, other foci, other regions. It's like the epilepsy starts to, you know, it starts in one region, then it starts to spread to another region. Now you have two areas that are, that are connected. You have a third area. So then the whole brain starts to become connected and you, you, you have an even bigger network of epilepsy. And she was able to show that with um, the research that she's doing, that you can actually impact these um, inter epileptic discharges by stimulating them with electrical current. So we know that, that you know, there are things like deep brain stimulation or trans or TMS, transcranial uh, magnetic stimulation. And so she was showing that, you know, if you, if you can figure out where the lesion is and you can figure out where these discharges are come from, and uh, then you can actually start to correct them with stimulation. Um, and so that just added another layer to, to the type of research we could do to look at this network. Then John Archer gave a wonderful talk talking about um, specifically the work he's doing in kids who have LGS, which is um, really, really interesting. And so he's doing simultaneously, he's recording from uh, LGS patients on an EEG, but he's also doing an MRI on them at the same time. And he wanted to know where is the LGS network, right? And is it the same across LGS patients? Um, and, you know, just to get to the punchline, there is uh, an LGS network. It comes from, so he was looking at, at PFA, um, this is GPFA, generalized proximal fast activity, slow spike and wave. And there are specific regions of the brain that light up. Um, so if it's red, it means there's a lot of activity happening there. If it's on, and this is overlaid on a brain MRI. And if it's green, there's less activity. And blue is less activity. But there are specific regions of the brain that light up with PFA and with with slow spike and wave. And it's it's very similar regions across patients. And so he's begun to do this work. He's been working on this for at least 10 years now that I know of to map the network. So he knows that the, the GPFA starts in the cortex and then it goes to the brain stem and then it comes back out to the thalamus and it goes back down into the spinal column. Um, and so he's beginning to figure out exactly where in the brain, where are the structures in the brain that these are coming from. And um, that's really important because it helps us to know, like, where can we stimulate? Where, where are the really bad brain waves coming from and, and how can we think about correcting them? Is there a medicine that we can create that targets th that specific region or is there a st brain stimulation that we can do in that region or is there something else we can think about um, as, we, as we look to treat where the problem is coming from, right? If you break your arm, you don't put a cast on your whole body to correct it, you just put it on your arm. So it's kind of that same idea. You go to the source and see if you can correct the problem. And even more interestingly, um, he's been able to map. So those brain regions are associated with certain network functions. And so when a brain, uh, a brain network is a bunch of different areas in the brain all working together. And there's some really commonly known ones. They're listed down here at the bottom of the slide. There's four listed here. There's one called the dorsal attention network, um, the anterior salience network, the executive control network, and the default mode network. And what he's shown so far in a number of patients is that a couple of the networks are totally fine in LGS patient. The dorsal attention network and the anterior salience network are fine. They're fine. They are not impacted. But two networks, the executive control network and the default mode network are impacted. Um, the executive control network is, is on when you're actively thinking. Like right now, if you're listening to me and you're thinking about what I'm saying, your executive control network is on um, and your default mode network should be off. But, um, and if you're just daydreaming, right? If you're not listening, if you're just you're letting your mind wander, then your default mode network is on and your executive control network is off. And he's showing, been um, able to show in some patients that those are both on at the same time, which would obviously make learning and memory really, really challenging. 
So again, his work is really trying to figure out where, where we can go into the brain, um, to where, what is the source, and then how is it having an impact. And he's also shown that in some cases that um, you can actually f- uh, fix or reverse the features of LGS in these, in these patients. So here was a patient who had surgery. I, this was a front, uh, they removed the focus of the brain. They had slow spike in wave um, on their EEG um, and, and GPFA. And then post-surgery 30 days that went away. So, and this person was seizure free. They had LGS, they were seizure free. And so there's evidence that, that if you can get seizure control, you can actually get the brain network to write itself. And this patient was seizure free as well, which was fantastic. But what does that do for the network, right? And this is um, a little bit hard uh, slide to look at, but those networks that I was just talking about them, they're up here. So here's ECN is the executive control network. And here's the uh, dorsal network here. And this is uh, in normal people or in healthy controls, sorry, typical people. Um, And this is the pattern of what their networks would look like if you were to, to map all those colors into one place. And for LGS patients, that map, it it looks very, very different um, and it's not as as detailed. And he's actually shown that um, if uh, in patients who get brain surgery or get brain stimulation, that their mapping starts to look more normal. So their network function gets better. And then we know that that if you can get seizure control or if you can reduce seizures dramatically, that you can actually start to see improvements in your kids. That's what happened to my daughter as well. And and we know that from a number of cases. And so it's really interesting um, work coming out showing that you can try to treat the network and you can see changes and and having the slow spike and wave around and the GPF around is bad. But if we take them away, that that you can see improvements. So it's really exciting work coming out of um, Dr. Archer's lab. Tracy, can I interrupt with a question? Yes. Um, Yes. It's a sort of a a, a question slash statement, I suppose, but it has a question mark at the end. Um, Kids with autism have slow wave pattern, but perhaps not the spike aspect. Not sure. Um, yes. Um, yes. Uh, so some kids with autism also have LGS. So in that case, they would show the slow spike in wave. So the very the thing about LGS is that the slow spike in wave is a very specific size, and um, it's one. Uh, it's less than two point five per second. Um, so it has a very specific size to it, and that's why it's called the slow spike in wave. Um, but yes, you can definitely see slowing, general slowing in kids with autism and with LGS. But what makes LGS unique is this um, less than 2.5 hertz slow spike in wave. And then also this generalized proxismal fast activity, this GPFA. I'm not sure if that answered the question. I hope so. Thanks. Other questions, Jen? Nope. Okay. No, not not right now. Um, there is a okay. way to your slides, and um, uh, I believe that will be um, they'll be available. Awesome. Yes, I'm happy to share my slides. Um, so I want to keep going and talking about um, the session. So then, Zach Grinspan, we shifted gears a little bit here from brain imaging and finding the region of the brain uh, where. The, the LGS problems are coming from and how we might address that with brain stimulation or, or um, you know, even maybe a medicine one day, we're not quite there for that yet. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Then we pivoted a little bit to start talking about what are we learning in the clinic from patients who actually have LGS that we've been following over time. So Dr. Grinspad came in and he started talking about what they see in their New York clinic um, in LGS patients. So he, um, uh, they had uh, 175 patients that they followed and ultimately were able to pull out 33 that had LGS. And then and this is just a single center in New York at Cornell, and they want to expand that to look at other centers. Um, but this is often done with a small number of patients to, and 33 is actually not a, a small number um, of LGS patients, but um, uh, to, to see if there are any patterns that emerge. And what he found is, so down here at the bottom is the age of the child of one of the 33 kids. And then here um, on on the left side is cumulative incidents of when they first saw something. So this green light shows when these um, 33 people had their first seizure. So most of them had their first seizure uh, under the age of four. Um, And you can see the majority were under the age of two because most of the green falls under the age of two. 
Um, and then you would follow the rest of the patients and you would follow this um, red line is when they had their first tonic seizure. Tonic seizures are very highly correlated in LGS. Nearly every, um, I think every LGS patient has tonic seizures, but um, uh, it, it, they're not always present initially, but they're present in every adult. But when they have their first tonic seizure um, it, it is across time here. And then the blue line is when the first slow spike in wave shows up uh, on the EEG. And then the, the fourth line down here is status epilepticus. So across this history, he identified these gaps between the first seizure and when slow spike and, spike and wave shows up and when slow spike and wave shows up and when the tonic seizure um, shows up. And he came up with a proposal of how you might, um, if, this, if this can be replicated, how we might treat more aggressively to prevent the development of, of LGS, the evolution of it. So the first opportunity was to, in this gap, right? So this is when their first seizure starts. And then this is when they develop the, um, uh, the uh, slow spike and wave in the center here. And then this is when they've got um, the tonic seizure appearing in the green. Can you intervene in between this gap? And so what, who, you know, can you identify who's at risk? Can you give them a high dose medicine? We may have a seizure. We may have a drug on the market now that could prevent this, but we don't know because we've never looked. So that was his first you know, opportunity was aggressive treatment of the slow spike in wave um, and, uh, in, in any patient, whether or not the seizures are there or not, because we know slow spike in wave is bad. The second intervention point was um, to potentially intervene very early in life. So you have young children who um, just started uh, having seizures and you know they're at high risk. So if a baby is born um, and they have suffered hypoxic ischemia or HIE, they're at very high risk of developing seizures. So can we can we treat them early, um, preventive, prevent the first seizure from developing? Uh, what if there's a specific gene mutation and we did like neonatal screening at birth and we know that there's a 98% chance that this baby can develop seizures. Can we treat early there with some sort of gene therapy or targeted precision medicine? And then the third area that he um, identified was to optimize infantile spasms. So the big chunk, it's about 30% of, of babies who develop infantile spasm, who have infantile spasms will go on to develop LGS. It's a big number. And so can we intervene at the infantile spasm stage? If we can stop spasms and figure out how to stop it there, that would stop the evolution in a lot of patients. Um, and so these are all experiments that, that you know, he could, could, we theoretically could do to try to see if we could uh, prevent LGS or prevent the, the progression of LGS if you've already have it. And then Dr. Delanis de Lugo saw, um, hopped on and he started talking about clinical trials and he was the last speaker in our group where he specifically focused on disease modifying therapies in LGS. Um, and what would it take um, the FDA has sets a really hard by, uh, high, a high bar for what a disease modifying therapy is, right? That's very dip, different than a medicine that treats seizures. Um, and again, this, this is a medicine that treats the biology of the disease, right? So right now, what we know about LGS and its biology is that um, you can have a genetic defect, you can, which, which you can treat, you can have an, uh, a, a, an injury or meningitis or an infection that you can treat, but then you also have these abnormal EEG patterns, which we know are coming from certain regions of the brain, we're starting to identify where that you can also treat. So you would treat those underlying disease processes, but you would also have to have an impact on patients. And he started to talk about what that would look like if we wanted to do a clinical trial there. He also talked about, you know, if you wanted to create a disease modifying therapy and you want to consider these other dimensions of uh, not just epilepsy, like you've got persistent seizures, but you also have excessive burden of medications, you've got cognitive decline, you've got psychosocial dysfunction, you've got dependent behavior, restricted lifestyle, increased death, and the neurobiological changes, you have to be able to measure that. Um, so if we want if we want a medicine that targets sleep and communications and mobility and seizures, et cetera, we have to be able to measure those things. And we currently really can't do those. We're not even really very good at measuring um, you know, uh, the, the, the things that we get asked all the time. And so these are all the, the tests. Many of you guys have probably seen these, whether or not you've been in a trial, um, like the Vineland on here, um, the Vineland aptitude battery or the Bailey scale measure behaviors and their off and development. They often um, have these, uh, they give this to our kids in school. 
to test how they're doing, to test their IQ. And, and if you've ever filled one of these out for your level with LGS, you often find that we either hit a ceiling or a floor. They'll say something like, compared to their peers, how do they perform on this task? And so everybody checks, no, <laughs> they, can't, they can't do this compared to their peers. And so everyone with LGS is like, no, compared to their peers, just take that sentence out. But then on the other end, they'll say, who with LGS has sleep issues? And everyone with LGS, you know, will raise their hand. We all have some sort of sleep issue, but we don't have enough detail to know if it's nocturnal seizures, trouble falling asleep, trouble staying to sleep, too much sleep, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So um, he talked about how we would need to create some, some tools to, to measure these things. So that was uh, session two. Um, and then we entered our last session, session three. And again, don't hesitate to ask any questions if you have any. Um, and this was this one got even more science. Well, I was science nerding out uh, on this one. I do have one question, Tracy. Okay. Um, to, before you move on, um, the improvements with deep brain stimulation, uh, do they ever happen with the NS2? Yes, yes. Um, right now, so deep, deep brain stimulation is not approved in the United States for use in LGS. Uh, as far as I know, um, I don't under, fully understand the approval process in Australia, which is where Dr. Archer was doing his deep brain stimulation work. There are patients, so just because it's not approved for LGS in the United States, does not mean it's being not being used. It's being um, used, it's approved for Parkinson's disease, and so it can be used off-label. So just like um, if you, uh, uh, yeah, many of you guys know what off-label use means that, that somebody, could, for, I'll use my example. My daughter um, has calcium channel mutations and there's a drug that she's on, it's called verapamil, that's, it's not FDA approved for LGS or for seizures, it's used for high blood pressure and for uh, arrhythmias in the heart. And, but she is prescribed it by her doctor off-label. And that's something that we can do in the States and, and probably um, in some other places, I don't know, although not everywhere. And so it's being used here in the States and um, needs to be studied, but, uh, and it's really hospital dependent. So I know certain hospitals, um, CHOP, Stanford are uh, implanting with, with the VNS is in there as well. Whereas other hospitals are saying, no, you can't have VNS and DBS. So um, good question. Hope that helped. All right, so the, the last session was really focused on how do we advance basic research? And this all comes down to the question of, all right, so we, we think we have a good idea from Dr. Archer's work where in the brain the LGS network is. Now, it needs to be re replicated, more work needs to be done there scientifically, but we think we know where it's coming from by studying lots of kids. Um, and what, but what is in those regions? So if, if he's identified this, this, this very specific region and these very specific networks, but how do you go into those networks and figure out what cells? Networks are made up of neurons. What neurons? And how do those neurons talk to each other? And what channels are on those neurons, like calcium channels and sodium channels, and, and what proteins are there? And the only way to do that is to do basic science research or research in animal models. Um, and so we had three talks uh, really looking at what's possible in this area. If this is an, if this type of work does not happen in LGS at all, uh, we do not have any uh, LGS specific models. There are lots of models of seizures, so it does happen there and I'll talk about that. So Scott Baraban, who was the moderator for this session gave the first talk and he really talked about if you're gonna have an animal model that you have to align it in three ways. It, and, and he used these um, very uh, sciencey words, construct validity, face validity, and predictability validity. Basically what this means is construct validity, validity means how closely does the model that you're using, whether it's a cell, a model of cells, if it's a mouse, if it's a fish, if it's a bunny, a pig, or a human, how well does it, does it capture the, the disease cause, right? So if the disease cause is a genetic mutation then, um, and you, you put a genetic mutation into a mouse or into some cells or into a fish, uh, how well does it capture that, that cause or that mechanism? Face validity is different and it's how closely the, the animal resembles uh, what the patient has, right? So you can knock out a gene or create a gene defect in an animal model and they might not have seizures, but, but the human, has seizures, so, so that's face validity. And then predictive validity is, is how uh, likely is it that this model is gonna predict treatment response in humans, 
right? So just because I take my, or let's say I create a mouse model and I create a gene defect in it and I give it a medicine and it fixes the, and, and the mouse has seizures and I give it a medicine and it stops the seizure. How predictive is that model that that medicine is now gonna work in people? And so uh, just setting the stage for all the things that scientists have to think about as we think about how we might move the field forward. Um, so he, he actually has done quite a bit of this work. He works in zebrafish, and this was in a Gervais syndrome mouse model or a Gervais syndrome fish model. He also works in other models as well, but this was in the fish and also in mice, um, where he took fish, he put the uh, Gervais syndrome SCN1A mutation in there. He did a drug screen with 3,500 drugs. He identified six compounds. Um, the fish actually do seize, have seizures. Um, and so he screened them for changes in seizure behavior. Uh, identified six medicines, and then he got three of the compounds um, are, are moving forward uh, with the FDA, and one a compound is moving into phase two clinical trials. So zebrafish are a good model for seizures in, in Dravet of, of moving medicines forward. So they have all three of those, uh, those, they have concept validity, they have face validity, and they have predictive validity. So um, so he just set the stage for this very sciencey talk um, that I think that um, uh, was even over my head in some cases um, about uh, what we might be able to do to, to break down the network and, and to treat the network. So Allison Motri gave a talk specifically about cell models, and some of you may know about these um, things called brain organoids. Essentially how this works is they take a skin biopsy uh, and I think they're taking biopsies from other areas as well now. Um, when I was in the lab, we were doing skin biopsies and we put those skin, skin, skin cells in a dish. We turn them into human pluripotent stem cells. And then those stem cells can be turned into uh, embryo, embryoid bodies, which then can be differentiated into brain cells. And, and those can create these things called organoids, cerebral organoids, which have lots of different layers and tissues and types of cells in the brain. And you can actually use these um, when they develop into an organoid, they have electrical activity. You can measure that electrical activity when you create um, these organoids from uh, uh, cells of humans who have seizures. You can often see very abnormal electric uh, electrical activity in these cells, and then you can throw medicines at it, you know, drugs, and, and try to stop it. So this is one way to study it, and Dr. Motri talked about that. Um, Megan Dennis then gave a talk about zebrafish. So she is actively taking fish, very much like Dr. Baraban mentioned. Um, she's putting genetic mutations in them, so she works specifically on the SARGAP2C1, um, and she creates the model, and she looks at their overall um, morphology. So how do they look? Do they have a big head? Is their brain small? Are their eyes uneven? Things like that. They look at brain size. They can drill down to the neural subtypes and then they can measure seizures in these animals. And again, she can screen these with medicines. Um, so this is another thing we could do. We could do this with all 150 LGS genes and try to find a medicine that might work there. Um, and then, you know, uh, nobody's really looking right now at the other forms of epilepsy, like epilepsy due to infection, they're researching those in other ways, or epilepsy due to hypoxic ischemia, those are being researched in other ways, not with fish, but um, this would be a way that we could research uh, like slow spike and wave and GPFA in, in fish, if we, could, if we could match them up with those different types of the face validity and predictability, et cetera. And then finally, Ming Shan Zhu talked about mice. Um, he, you know, he again is using genetic models. All of these uh, these lists down here at the bottom are all of the genes that um, have been identified in the epilepsies. Probably not all of them. There's probably more. These are probably the de novo epileptic encephalopathy genes. He studies this one, STXBP1, which is pretty common. It's the number of cases over here on the left. SCN1A is the most common. KCNQ2 is the next in the in the once we've studied. And he's actually created, he's taken the mutation that they see in human patients, he's put it in his mouse, and he's measured um, behavior in his mouse and seizure recording. So you video record the seizures, and they also have them hooked up to an EEG here, and do see the seizures. And now he's beginning to do drug screening, um, and treatment screening to see if he can help this. So this is something else we could do, you know, to see if we have 
uh, a mouse model that has slow spike and wave, um, which I'm really happy to report that we just funded a grant on Jennifer Carney, and there was a, a write-up on her in your program that, that many of you got uh, talking about her work, but her mouse model does have slow spike and wave. And um, she's gonna be working, there was a collaboration that formed in, our, in the conversation on Tuesday, she and Megan Dennis are going to work together. Megan Dennis, if you remember, is the one that, um, uh, it, or not Megan Dennis, um, uh, Jennifer Galinas. Um, she was the one that was taking her models and stimulating the enterical epileptic discharges and showing that she could uh, uh, change the epilepsy in her, in her model. And so she's going to be working on, on that mouse that's now, we hope, an LGS mouse. Uh, time will tell. Science always requires replication and further study uh, to make sure it's we're not that we're seeing something that's real. So we had a wonderful, lively discussion after that, and um, and and the scientists were really asked to say, "Okay, you just heard three talks. This is what LGS is. This is the the emerging clinical research and things we could do. Um, we learned that LGS is a network disorder, so it affects the whole network. Um, but we also know that it, it's caused by seizures that have discrete causes. And we really asked our scientists to say, if we wanted to treat the, let's, let's ignore pre-LGS for a second. We're, well, we'll get to that later. But let's just think about, you have LGS now, you've got slow spike and wave and PFA. How do we treat that? How do we treat that network problem? And we had a great discussion where people came out and, and gave us a laundry list of things we could fund at the LGS Foundation. Um, and I'll show you that a little bit later today uh, in, in my second talk after the breakout sessions. So, um, so we really uh, pushed the scientists to think about this disease modifying therapy as it relates to LGS. And very soon um, after this first meeting, um, we, we are going to get them thinking about pre-LGS. There's a lot of work going on on pre-LGS, but, um, but we are the LGS Foundation and we want scientists to be working on LGS. We got them thinking specifically about us being in crisis and us needing to be uh, uh, get out of this constant crisis mode. And so they gave us some ideas about how we can start to look at that. Uh, we had lengthy discussion about all of these other areas that we need to understand and measure. Um, if, if LGS is not just the seizures, the, then how do we measure all these other things? And, and that can only come from you guys as families, as from us, as, as caregivers and people who are living with LGS. We have to say what matters most to us. And that's what we're going to be talking about here in just a few minutes. Um, and then we had, yes. Um, was there any, uh, there's a question about, um, was there any discussion about how frequently MRIs should be completed? There was not. Um, uh, so I know that Elaine Worrell gave a talk. So our family, con so this is our scientific conference where we get, come together and we ask our scientists to really talk deeply. But we have a family conference every other year. And, and the plan is that this science conference will happen every other year. And in the off years, a family conference will happen. So there was a family conference last year where that was talked about. Um, and those slides are up on our YouTube channel. You can go watch all of those. And Elaine Worrell gave another talk there um, that addressed that. Um, and then uh, we're having another family conference in June of 2022 uh, in Dallas, Texas. So uh, uh, it'll be a place for you guys to come save the date. It's uh, this June 17th through 19th. Um, but the short answer is, um, if your loved one has ever had uh, a three Tesla MRI, a three T MRI or higher, that they're probably uh, okay uh, in terms of not needing another MRI right now. Often repeat MRIs, well, first of all, repeat MRIs are really hard <laughs> on us. I, we have to state my daughter for all the MRIs. Um, she's not going to lay still in there. Um, and, um, that's really hard on our kids, the hospital stay, it's hard in the families. Um, and then a sedated MRI can also impact the results because they often hook them up to the EEG at the same time. And it can impact the EEG and long recovery. Um, repeat MRIs are often done really in early in the course of LGS to see if there are brain changes happening. 
And then later on, um, like if it's a degenerative disease, like are, are they losing white matter? Are they losing gray matter to see if it's degenerative? There are some uh, causes of seizures that can lead that evolve to LGS where it's degenerative and, and the kids slowly, uh, progressively, um, parts of their brain die. And then these kids often don't survive very long. Um, it, it, if kids don't have a progressive cause of their LGS, uh, they often don't get MRIs in adulthood unless they, um, unless two things happen. If they have a focus, like if, 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 if you see on the EEG seizures are coming from a specific brain region, that's a reason to get stronger, uh, MRI, right? So three Tesla is pretty good for identifying like birth injury and things like that, but five Tesla, seven Tesla, I think there's even 10 Tesla now getting these higher, um, resolution, like it's a better camera if there's a focus might help you identify where, where they can do a resective surgery, which I think is a really, really good odds if you can do that. But otherwise, if, if there's no, my daughter, her, her EG, it comes from everywhere. There's no one place. So the only time she would get an MRI is if she um, had a skull fracture or something like that. So I hope that sort of helps um, answer the question. They're often done a couple times early in the course um, you know, if you have a loved one who's older and had a 1.5 Tesla or 1.5 T MRI, um, then it might be worth it to go get a 3T to ask the doctor, but not if that's going to create massive hardship on your family or do harm to your loved one, obviously. So, and there so is, is one. Other, oh, go ahead. Right. No. And there is one other question. Um, uh, I would like to connect with researchers and other families who see connections uh, between pandas and MCAs, and and she wants to know: Does the LGS Foundation have a database of patients with certain co-occurring conditions? We do not yet have a database. And um, when I give my talk this afternoon about where we're going next, that's one of the things that we need. I feel like everyone that doesn't mean databases don't exist. It just means that we, as the patient families, do not have access to them. Scientists have them and academics have them. Our doctors have them. Uh, drug companies have them. Uh, the FDA has them. Everyone has them but us. And, um, you know, that's just the way science used to happen is that everything sort of happened in these silos. But now, you know, with the Internet and with the World Wide Web and sharing and, um, you know, the ability to, to electronically share things. And we need to be the owners and stewards of our own data. Um, because everybody has it, everybody's profiting, profit, profiting off of it. Um, and it's very frustrating. Uh, I'm happy to talk. If you want to email me um, offline, I can talk to you about pandas. And the best way is to try to connect with researchers who have actually published on it and then try to get them to see if their families will, if you've probably already done this, but if the families will be willing to, um, to contact you. So they would, the, they would give the families that they've studied your name, and then that family would choose to contact you. So, but I'm happy to talk to you about that offline. So, all right, well, let me just finish up. So, um, so we, we also, you know, in addition to talking about disease modifying therapy, and then talking about this hierarchy of needs, we also talked about, you know, how we might measure these other things. And this is really important, because this is the conversation we're about to have. Um, we also talked about, um, and had our scientists weigh in on all of these things working together, the seizures, and the medicines impacting all of the areas that we have issues include and sleep impacting all of those areas too. And that's really what leads to our breakouts, which are happening right now. So um, for this part of the session, um, the, this is what's gonna happen. The 50 families who registered for uh, being in the breakout, we just took the first 50 people that registered for the conference. And we had to keep these small because we need to have uh, very concrete discussions. We're not going to live stream this part because of privacy reasons. We want to protect our family's privacy. The, the, there will be these discussion rooms. There's going to be five discussion rooms. And we're going to ask the question, what do you are, want from the next LGS treatment that your loved one tries? Right? If we're thinking as patient and families about disease, we want a disease modifying therapy. Um, I don't think any, I mean, maybe there will be some of you in the crowd that are like, we just want more medicines to target seizures and the, and, and gig. they can keep making them the same way they've always made them. I've never met a family that said that, um, you know, usually by the time we failed our seventh or eighth drug, we're not very excited anymore about drugs and, and things, but we want something that's really going to treat the whole syndrome and, and help us. But we, as the families, it's so important. This is just, this is just one of the many areas we need to be involved in, but this is a very important one. What do we want? What does a disease modifying therapy look like? 
we can stop seizures in 99% of, of our LGS loved ones by putting them in a coma. But none of us want our LGS loved ones to be in a coma. So, so it's more than just seizures. What is that more? And when you go into the breakout, you're just going to be our, our five moderators and I'll be floating into each of the rooms. If you guys have any questions, we're going to lead you through a series of, qu of questions, because if we can answer this question as a group, right? And so this is this like focus group here where we just want to hear what you guys have to say about these things, right? We want to hear your stories, want to hear what you're dealing with. Then we would try to organize that into a survey and then survey the community much more broadly and then bring that information to the scientists and say, this is what we found. And then, and then move that into the research world. Because as patients and families, we are the only ones that should be weighing in on what is most important to us. Um, and for years, I think science and medicine have decided for us that seizures were the most important thing and they are a massive problem, don't get me wrong, but it's more than that. And we wanna help them to understand that. So um, if you are going to be joining into the breakout room, you need to log in to uh, the, the, the Zoom meeting. And if you have logged in, so if you see up here on the top of the screen, I've logged in as Tracy. Um, and uh, up here at the top, when I'm logged in, if I'm invited to the Zoom room, there'll be a box up there that says join the breakout room on the screen in the ballroom. Um, if you do not have that box, then either you're not logged in or you're not registered for that piece of it. And if you, uh, unfortunately, we can't take anybody else in uh, to the uh, rooms at this time. We, we had our first 50, um, but we promise we are going to have more discussion like, discussions like this in the future. This is not the end of the conversation. It's just trying to figure out what are the questions that need to be asked. So at this time, um, I think if everybody who is, is, is going to join in the breakout room, come and join us, we're over here. Um, the rest of you, um, uh, we will make uh, all of the information that comes out of this break room available, but we wanna give families a safe space to talk. We don't wanna uh, uh, evade their privacy. Um, but we will share everything that we learn. And this is just the beginning of the conversation. We have more of these. And then everybody can come back. Um, I, someone's going to have to remind me what time we're coming back because I'm thinking in, I'm thinking in uh, Pacific time. And I know it's a So we come at, back at 2 p.m. Eastern time. So 2 p.m. New York time. Um, and there will be uh, another talk about where we're going next with research. We'll summarize a little bit about the breakout rooms and then we'll close out from there. Um, Tracy? So we hope you guys will come back at 2 p.m. Eastern. Yes. Um, it, it's probably a good idea to just let everybody know that we have a webinar as well where they can ask questions um, this coming Wednesday that they might want to register for. Yes, and that is in my next presentation, but we can definitely mention this now and this coming Wednesday, our Research Revolution webinar. Um, I think our team members could put this into the chat, a link to that if you want to register. I will be there to answer uh, all of your questions. Well, I'll try to answer all of your questions, um, and I will, uh, if we can't answer them, we will find somebody who can answer them um, about everything that's happened in the last three days or any other questions that you have. Great, Jen, thank you, that's really helpful. So at that, um, I think we are done. If you guys will join the breakouts for the rest of you guys, we hope you'll join us back here at 2 p.m. Eastern time for the wrap up of the session. Um, and I just wanna thank you guys all for being here. Um, if we as patient families aren't a part of, of the research process, if we if we don't take the time to learn this and understand it, then, um, then we're not gonna be able to find uh, treatments that are really, really meaningful. We're gonna to have to wait for scientists and doctors to figure it out without our help. And it would be just so much better if we could help them. It'll go faster and we'll save time and money um, and, and hopefully leave it better than we found it because LGS is, is awful. Um, thank you guys so much. And I'm looking forward to the breakouts and I'm looking forward to seeing everybody again back here at 2 p.m. Eastern.